I have a lot to say, and I wanted to start right, right off by uh, starting this PowerPoint. Uh, there we go. Oops, I'm going faster. So uh, I'm going to put this off to the side. Okay, so here, here's uh, uh, the region we're going to talk about today, uh, not just the river and the river valley, but uh, the whole watershed and uh, river basin, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Before I do, I wanted to bring this to your attention. I'm assuming that everybody who's attending is a Presumpscot River devotee, and, if, and you may already have the book on the left, The River Voices, uh, and it's out in the past month or two, and I think it should, I think it should be on everybody's uh, bookshelf if you live in the vicinity. Uh, it covers a lot of different topics uh, from you know, early inhabitants of the region to art, to uh, the gunpowder mills and lots of other topics. And the second reason for mentioning it is because if, if uh, you need to review what's said today, chapter two in the book is exactly what I'm going to talk about. So uh, the geology of the Presumpscot River, it's pretty much the same. So using uh, a, a dictum that my wife, former reporter has always told me is to tell you what I'm gonna tell you, then tell you, and then tell you what I told you. And that's the plan, uh, that's the plan for today. So. Uh, here's uh, an image of the Presumpscot River watershed. That's the area surrounded with the red dashed line and some of the statistics about the watershed, uh, 648 square miles surface area. It's about the river itself is about, the Presumpscot River itself is about 26 miles. But notice that the watershed is divided up into lots of other smaller watersheds, uh, like the Pleasant River watershed, uh, the Little River watershed, and each of those segments, which are tributaries to the Presumpscot, are uh, separated by a divide. That's the other colored dashed line, and a divide is this boundary between adjacent watersheds. I always say that if you stood on the boundary, let's say between uh, the uh, Little River uh, branch and the main branch stood, stood over here and uh, you uh, poured a glass of water to the east, it would flow into the main trunk. Flow, if you pour it in off to the Southwest, It'll flow into the liver, Little River and eventually get into the main branch of the Presumpscot. So these are little segments within the overall Presumpscot River watershed. And you should note that from the headwaters near Sebago to the sea is about a 267 foot change in elevation. So what we're gonna do for the rest of the evening is talk about these areas. <clears throat> In the background of, your, of the presentation is the time frame for the events that have shaped the area. In other words, what are the processes <clears throat> that shaped the bedrock? What are the actual types of bedrock? What did the glaciers do to the underlying bedrock? What deposits did the glacier leave? How did it change the landscape? And what are some of the recent events that are putting little uh, minute changes in the landscape what, you know, at a time frame that we could see? So here's the geological time scale. Now, I don't expect you to have it memorized by the end of the evening, but um, uh, I'll repeat it from time to time. So we're gonna be focusing on these bracketed 
time frames, and particularly the early portion of the Paleozoic, let's say we often say the last from 600 million years ago to about uh, 245 million years ago is the whole of the Paleozoic. <clears throat> but in terms of the rocks we have around here, the bedrock uh, that we have here, initially that before it became a rock, there was sediment accumulating in an ocean in this region. And that sediment was accumulating in these lower portions of the Paleozoic, the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian <clears throat> periods until that basin in which those sediments were accumulating started to close. And let me ex uh, explain that here. First, let's think a little bit of, before we get to the bedrock types, explain a little bit about how geologists go about unraveling <clears throat> the pile of rocks that we can see. And there's some two basic rules. <clears throat> One is called the law of superposition. Essentially, as sediments accumulate in, the, accumulate in the sea, the oldest are on the bottom and the youngest are on top. How do we tell the age? By the fossil content in them or just strictly relative age, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top. I mention this because the geology of Maine is much more complicated because everything has been folded and mashed and turned over. So sometimes the oldest is actually on the top. I'll explain more about that later. So rule number one for sediments, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top. Secondly, a rule that we use in unraveling earth history is cross-cutting relationships. That which cuts something else must be younger than the cut, cutted or cut entity. So for instance, you can see that um, layer B here has been offset by this fault along E. And so has D. So using superposition, C is the oldest, B is the next oldest, A is the youngest. But then <clears throat> D cut into those three, but then all four of them, A, A, B, C, and D were cut by a fault. So you, <clears throat> you can get a relationship of the ages there. Some little twists that enter into this history is when you have volcanic, intrusions or intrusions of granite that actually are younger than the rocks into which they intrude. Uh, so the intrudor is always younger than the intrudee is one way to think about it. So <clears throat> all of this I mentioned because the motion of the plates and the theory and now pretty much model of plate tectonics plays a role in the building of ocean basins, the closing of ocean basins, and the deformation of sediments that were trapped in those ocean basins. So this is the basic model of the plates. Presumably there are plumes of inner core material that are creating a big heat driven system I like to tell people they should think of this and <clears throat> think of it as boiling water and currents move up from the center of the boiling pot, reach the top. If it was milk, you would see that sometimes the skin on the milk is moved away from the center and towards the edges. And if there happen to be sediments on the ocean floor, they take a ride along with that moving plate. And over at the edges where there may be a deep sea trench, 
these sediments get carried down towards uh, the crust once again. I, I can show it, I can't show it so well with waving my arms and pointing at pictures, but take a look at this animation that has no sound. <clears throat> this is the forming of Pangaea. Pangaea is the name we give to the super duper continent <clears throat> that formed from plate motion during the last 200 or so uh, million years. So it's the coming together. Now the, the problem with this illustration is for to make it look like we know where we are, they've put in the continents as we know them today, but they haven't always been shaped the way we see them. So you'll see different presentations that show how the continental areas changed over time. So remember, we're talking about the sediments that are being deposited along the continental shelves and into the ocean basins. They're getting squished where the oceans come together, the ancient Pacific. And here's the closing of the Atlantic it was had a different name back in, in the time when Pangaea came together. So this is the way the Pangaea, the super duper continent appeared uh, roughly um, about 350 million years ago. So here's just a, a map view of that. This ocean between what became North America, Laurentia was called the Iapetus Ocean. And uh, the one in um, the area of the Mediterranean was called the Paleotethes. And so here's in the lower right illustration is the coming together of Paleo North America, Laurentia, and um, <clears throat> India, uh, Africa, and a bit of Antarctica in here. So this is just two different views of um, the coming together of Pangaea. Now, this coming together and the squeezing of the sediments trapped between the approaching continents is an important factor in building the bedrocks of Maine, bedrock of Maine. <clears throat> and so I wanted to take the time to show this animation, which does have sound, and it's a wonderful modeling of sediments being squeezed in a paleo tectonic environment by a Swiss geologist. How do mountains form? We see them in just a moment of time, but they form over millions of years. Mountain belts extend for hundreds, even thousands of kilometers, and their structures penetrate deep into the earth. So their size and age make their formation difficult to understand. French geologist Jacques Malavier builds sand models that mimic the formation of mountain belts and allow scientists to study this complex process. In order for an experiment that runs for only a few minutes, but represents natural phenomena that happen over many tens of millions of years, we have to choose a material whose deformation behavior does not depend on time. Sand is a very good material for simulating rock deformation. In the experiment, the different stratigraphic layers which represent the sediments and the continental crust have different mechanical properties. We mix the sand grains with a finer powder, which increases the sand's resistance to deformation. 
Thus, we have heterogeneous material made up of more resistant layers and less resistant layers. Mountain belts are created when continents collide. In this experiment, we see two continents separated by an ocean. Now watch what happens as the plates converge. As one plate subducts or dives beneath the other, the ocean basin closes. The continental crust, which is lighter than oceanic crust, cannot be subducted. Instead, as the continents collide, the crust thickens and is forced up. Note how the sand is folded and faulted. We see similar structures in the rocks in mountains. One important factor not accounted for in this model is erosion. Erosion exposes the deformed rocks that were once deeply buried in the mountain belt. The green sand represents the rocks of the ocean basin. Note that it's been trapped between the two continents, marking their original boundary. These two we see in mountain belts. It's very difficult to understand the deep structure of a mountain belt by direct observation. The sand model allows us to compress time and space and simulates the internal structure of mountains. And that <clears throat> I, I really like that animation and the modeling because it's exactly what happened in Maine. So this is a, a, a detailed cross section of uh, Maine. Here's the little map up in the left-hand corner, uh, a cartoon showing how the rocks were deformed on a large scale. The, the only added thing I want to say here is that the deformation that we saw in the laboratory, pardon me, laboratory experiment didn't erode those formations to the depths at which we see them here in Maine. In other words, if these folds, see how these folds exist, say like it was in the uh, laboratory experiment, and then think about eroding off the, the top. These, this erosion occurs concurrently with the deformation. And so the block diagram in the bottom here is showing what you would see at the surface if you cut off the top of all those folds. And what you would see in the side view, if you happen to have fortunate enough to have really mountainous terrain, terrains as they do in Switzerland, so you could see the folds on the sides of big valleys, or else here where there happens to be a deep valley cut, you may see some of those folds. Uh, uh, present. So before we get back to some of the details of the geology in, in Maine, a little side visit to the types of rocks that can be formed in the geological realm. The, uh, those rocks that cool from a molten material, we call them igneous, and they can cool underground or they can cool on the surface underground you, and then exposed later like granite or uh, spewed out onto the surface like lava or magma uh, would create basalt. Sedimentary rocks are those that form from all of the sands and gravels and muds and were compacted and compressed and buried so that they essentially uh, were lithified or welded together to form rocks they may preserve their original sedimentary layering. And then the third family are metamorphic rocks. Those are that have been changed, pre-existing rocks, pre-existing igneous metamorphic or sedimentary rocks that have undergone great change because of heat, pressure, and chemically active fluids. So when we're talking about Maine, we pretty much can exclude the middle uh, types, the sedimentary rocks, but keep in mind that the rocks we do have as metamorphic rocks were 
originally sedimentary rocks, then they have undergone change. So the common rocks in Maine that are derived, the majority of the rocks in Maine uh, are gneisses, schists, marbles, phyllites, slates, and quartzites, metasandstones. So I put it in italics. Metamorphic rocks are far and away the dominant rock type that you're going to see here in the state of Maine. So let's do that first category, bedrock. So here, go, revisiting our geological time scale, you see, I mentioned that before, in the lower part of the Paleozoic, you had all that sediments that were accumulating in the ocean basin between uh, what was Eurasia and Laurentia or North America. And then as the, uh, the Proto-Atlantic or the Iapetus Seaway closed, it squished those sediments to form the Appalachian Mountains of which we are part of the Appalachian Mountains. Not only should you think of the Appalachian Mountains as the uh, scar or place where all these rocks folded, you can see them better in Pennsylvania and further south, but not only was the folding this way, but it was tilted. So up by us, the deeper parts of the folds the buried parts of the folds are what ultimately got exposed here as, as, as the metamorphic portion of the sedimentary Appalachian mountains. So the further northeast you go along the Appalachians, the more metamorphosed the rocks are. So that closing of the Atlantic and the building of the Appalachians uh, is this and the Appalachians themselves are the suture or the scar where the continents came, came together. So the outcome is geological distributions such as you see here. Now I've got three different maps. The one in upper left is New York State. And I include it because the Southern part of New York State, pretty much South of the Mohawk Valley are sedimentary rocks. And these ones that are widely spaced ones here. And the ones up in the Northern part of the state have been partially metamorphosed because of the intrusion of the Adirondack Mountains, the blue here. And in the map to the right, you see the state of Maine uh, this is the a 2002 version of the map, and it shows in just general terms the northeast southwest trending pattern of the bedrock in the state. And that's because it's a whole series of folds, but cut off deeply below the surface. So it keeps the trend of the Appalachians, but we're more deeply embedded into it. So here's the, uh, an, another view of this, the state map. And by the way, if you go to the Maine Geological Survey webpage, you can download digital versions of these maps. But I included this one because it's a little hard to see, but there's this generalized geological cross section of the state here, as if you went from Northwest to Southeast across the state. These brown rocks over here are these brown rocks over here. This brown rock over here is this brown rock over here. So it shows you, and it has even the little, the tops of the folds, that have been eroded away. Here's a, a little, I didn't try to cut and paste this down below, but in, in, in enlarging it, it got a bit blurry. Forgive me on that. Okay, so coming to our neck of the woods, 
each area for the state of Maine has been mapped in detail by different geolog geologists working over time. And this is a part of the Portland one to 100,000 scale geologic maps also downloadable. Uh, I love the snipping tool that's available uh, with Word 10, uh, Windows 10. So I've snipped out, here's Sebago over here, the uh, headwaters of the river, and I've highlighted the river itself here, Portland, is Back Cove over here, Portland, head, Portland downtown over here, Peninsula. I also tried to, and I didn't finish it, uh, put in places where there are fall, waterfalls. Those are the, the dots. And notice how the dots fall at the boundaries between different rock formations. And that's because the rocks are, have a different hardness. Some are softer, some are harder. And I wanted to take a moment to thank Joanne Romano and Alan Kashub and Mike Stackhouse and Toby. They might be out there because I asked them, tell me where you've seen exposures of bedrock in the river valley. You know, people have canoed the whole thing, kayaked the whole thing. And um, the consensus is there ain't much to see along the river, uh, except maybe at near the dam. Certainly at Sakarapa, you can see lots of bedrock exposed at the falls and on either side. At Gambo, on one side of the river, you could see some. Uh, up where I am in uh, North Gorham Pond, there's waterfalls up here. You can see some bedrock there. So um, uh, hopefully people copy or will copy down my email address and say, oh, Erwin, go look over here on the river. Now, the thing is, this map, you have to realize is an interpretation. It's as if we stripped off all the soil, all the vegetation, all the sediments that covered it, that the glaciers laid down. How can you make such a map? The thing is, <clears throat> on the basis of the small exposures from place to place, people have compiled these maps and interpolated, interpreted that, okay, I can see it over here in a river valley. I can see it over here in a rock quarry or in Shaw Pit, <clears throat> little exposures, maybe, maybe five or at most 10% of what you see here has actually been seen in little road cuts or exposures from place to place. And so making such a map is definitely an interpretive skill. Now, but you can see the rocks at some places. So in uh, Fry's Leap, you can see the Sebago granite. Here's a, a bit of a close up of it. Or if you go to the, uh, what's now the Pike, well, it's not the Pike, it's what, what are we calling it now? The, the, the market basket, basket place, which used to be Pike Industries and before that Blue Rock Industries, the quarry that's mostly quartzite, a hard former sandstone that they're quarrying there. And if you go up along um, uh, Route 114, uh, north of uh, Route 25, you can see some of the Sebago granite intruded by basalt dikes. And a new location, newer location, <coughs> I was just telling this to someone. If you go behind Lowe's in North Windham, if they'll let you go there without wondering what you're doing there, there's a beautiful intrusive basalt dikes uh, there. So here you have igneous rocks that formed at depth 
as igneous intrusions, and they have been intruded at once again by much younger rocks uh, called basalt. So wh where did that basalt come from? Where it came from is when the Atlantic formed during beginning in the Triassic period around 245 million years ago, the crust was stretched again. And as it stretched, it allowed magma to work its way up into the surface, cut through the pre-existing metamorphic rocks. Remember the metamorphic rocks were formed here during the Appalachian mountain closure. And then the ocean opens up again a little bit east of the old scar. And uh, basalt welled up into it. There are some volcanic rocks in the Katahdin area. And as, if you go into Nova Scotia, is what's called the Triassic red beds. Or if you go down to New Jersey, the Palisades of New Jersey are all part of this up motion of basalt as the Atlantic opened up. No, I'm getting out of the story. I just want to say, from, so from the time that the Atlantic began to open till the time the glaciers arrived, you had this long period, close to 65, 70 million years of erosion. So that bedrock that I showed you in the previous maps were eroding under the activity of mostly streams until about 2 million years ago. Some people say the last million years, but 2 million years ago when the glaciers moved southward. So here's uh, uh, moving on to from the bedrock to the next major phase that shaped our state in the form of glaciation. Is this, remember this is, this is going back 650 million years. And what I'm illustrating by that is that there wasn't just one glacier that came our way, but repeated glaciations. Everything in yellow is a um, glacial period. And uh, excuse me, everything that's in gray is a glacial period and yellow is a warm period. So this is the last say, 10, 11,000 years is yellow over here. <clears throat> but the glaciation that did most of the work that shaped our landscape is called the Wisconsin glaciation of about 100,000 years ago till about 18,000 years ago. So what did the glaciers do? They shaped the landscape, they melted as they retreated and laid down deposits directly from the ice. The water that was flowing out from the nose of the glacier deposited sediments in streams and in the ocean. As the glaciers advanced, as the glaciers advanced, sea level got lower because the water was stored in the glacial ice. So sea level was lower. What the, related to the glaciation was the formation of the Przumscot clays and silts. And then the glaciers, when they left, that remaining time period of about 11 or 10,000 years allowed for soils to form and vegetation to take place. So the maximum extent of the glaciation of the Hudson uh, of the Wisconsin glaciation looked like this in this cartoon. Went as far south as Long Island, New York. And what it did at its margins was lay down these different types of deposits. Uh, moraines at the margin, drumlins, eskers, you can see these up near uh, Poland. Uh, springs, Rang Pond, and then sediments that filled valleys. Now, 
Here's the thing, as the glacier advanced, it shaped and sculpted the landscape by freezing and thawing in cracks in the rocks. And so this shape that looks like some people, it's called Rush Mutane because it's supposedly like a sheep lying in a field. I, I, I think it's a stretch of imagination, but that's what it looks like. This side is the smooth side, glaciers rode up, and then the steep side is plucked. And on those surfaces over here, you can see the, you can see some evidence of glacial striations. You, the white stuff is bird pucky, not uh, <laughs> minerals. Those stripes that are parallel to rock hammer, rocks trapped in the ice like garnets and sandpaper scrape the rocks. You can see this shape at Douglas Hill, Rattlesnake Mountain. And when you look out to the Casco Bay Islands, they have that shape, generally speaking. And in this sh shaded relief map of his Sebago here, this is Rattlesnake Mountain over here, steeper on the south, southeast facing side, Douglas Mountain, the same thing over here. It's got this general shape. And so here's the, this I want to point out, really important for our special condition. You know, Maine is special. Why? Because in Maine, the ice extended all the way out to the edge of the Gulf of Maine. But in Southern New England and in New York State, with sea level lower, the continental shelf was exposed. You could walk from the edge of the margin of the glacier to the edge of the sea. And how do we know that? Because we find mastodon skeletons out here. Now, either they were doing the backstroke or they walked out there and uh, died. Here in Maine, the water was lapping up against the edge of the ice. The other thing to point out is this map in the lower right, the thickness of the ice around Hudson Bay was really thick, probably seven miles thick. And at the edge here it was about a mile thick. So over Portland, when the ice was out here about 18,000 years ago, was more than a mile of ice in this area. How did it get here from here to here? I use the pancake explanation. You're pouring pancake batter. You pour the batter in one spot. It spreads out on the griddle. Snow and ice were accumulating in northern latitudes. It got thicker and thicker and thicker like this over here and spread out because ice behaves plastically and deformed and spread out like the pancake batter. But here's a close up view of what it looked like around here. Here's the ice in contact with the water. Maybe an iceberg broke off, floated out into the Gulf of Maine near where the ice was grounded, moraines were forming underwater. In New York state, they formed above ground, not underwater. As, as melted water came out from beneath the, beneath the ice, this melt water carried silt and clay with it, and it settled out onto the ocean floor, forming the silts and clays of the Presumpscot Formation. So after the ice retreat, retreated, an erosion began. Some places the moraines were exposed. Some places bedrock was exposed. Some places the clay was exposed. And that's what we can see in this surficial geologic map. So this covers the same area as we looked at at the bedrock map, except in this case, we've peeled off the soil and the vegetation 
and just looked at the glacial deposits. So everything here shown in uh, green are considered to be morainal deposits. Things that are in um, blue are marine deposits. And uh, this is also downloadable from the main geological survey. But the point I'm trying to convey is once again, uh, this kind of map is made from exposures. There are a lot more exposures of the surficial materials because people have made sand and gravel pits. The rivers have cut into this material so that there are many more exposures of surficial material than there is of the bedrock. So here's a little bit of a close up of it. Here's the Sebago area. This I've enlarged is this, this rectangle is here. Along the border of the lake is a large moraine. Some places the ice melted into big icebergs and then melted. And that's what formed otter ponds, the big lakes over here. All of the melting that occurred at the margin of the ice, remember sea level lower because as the ice came, I need a third arm. As the ice came and pressed down, sea level got lower. Then when the ice melted, the land didn't go boing. It went up slowly. So the sea was able to come in and cover some of it as the land rebounded due to the relief of the glacial load. So every place south of here is a lots of sand and gravel. The town of Standish has some big sand and gravel pits right off of Route 35 uh, in, in Standish. Everything that's shown in these red lines on this are the detailed ridges of a moraine. They're hard to see because they're only about 20 feet high. That's why I recommend people take a ride from Gorham Village to Sebago. And as you ride along that road, you'll go up the hill to Fort Hill, bedrock. You come down and then the, the ridges you start going over are moraines, subtle moraines, till you get to Finney Lumber is a big moraine. And then you get northwards and you finally come to Sebago and you come to the uh, big moraine that's blocking the exit of the river. Um, one thing I'll point out is that as the glaciers came along here, it scooped out Sebago Lake to a depth of, I think, 365 feet at maximum. And that's because the fractured granite that makes up this region was much more susceptible to being scoured out by the glaciers than was the metamorphic rocks to the southeast. So um, in addition to scouring out the bedrock, the, some of those rocks were transported so that they let, when the ice melted, they left big boulders lying around of the Sebago granite. So this one is right here on the Middle Jam Road where I am and other places formed ridges of moraines, as you see here. And I, this is a close-up of the map once again that shows these linear moraines. Uh, the sand and gravel that was deposited in the Presumpscot River drainage has blessed us, I suppose you could say, with uh, uh, natural resources. So every place you see a dot on here, there has been a sand and gravel pit or clay deposits that have been mined for bricks. So they have provided numerous resources and, and sand and gravel is the most common mineral industry in the state right now. And Gorham Wyndham 
has many, many sand and gravel pits, some abandoned, some active. So just to reemphasize this relationship between the advance of the glacier and the retreat, you can see here it's going back 140,000 years. And as the glacier advanced, sea level dropped. And for the last, say, 18, 20,000 years ago, the glaciers melted, sea level has been rising. Here's a little different view. Maximum sea level drop was about, this is in meters. So this is about 200 feet maximum. And it's still rising gradually for the last 6,000 years. And even more proof if you want it, here's a, the tidal graph for uh, our area showing the rise of sea level since 1922 to around 2013. So sea level is still rising. Of course, you have to be careful of the scale here. This one's in millimeters. So don't get nervous that it's meters or feet. But the point is that sea level still rising. Some of it has to do with adding water to the sea. And some of it has to do with the temperature of the water getting warmer and expanding. So when the sea extended into the state of Maine before the land totally rebounded, it formed this what's called the De Geer Sea. This is the area in which you find the Presumpscot Formation, of which is a picture of it here. That blue-gray clay that is the bane of septic systems and gardeners in some places. And this is a close-up of the different seven and a half minute topographic quadrangles of our area. So you can see how far in the edge of the sea was here. Remember, mountains were sticking up out of this ocean, just like the mountains stick up in Casco Bay. The same thing is happening here. Here's a little bit even closer view of that presumpscot clay the De Geer Sea and the mountains that were sticking up, the peninsula was sticking up out of the ocean at that time. And this illustration leads into the next area of topics that recent events included landslides in 1831, 1868, and uh, in 1983 in, in Gorham. And I want to mention, before we look at some of those landslides, I, I was, this is a bit of a cheat because this is a picture of the Connecticut River Valley. I wanna be honest, when sea level was lower, the Presumpscot cut a much deeper channel than we see today. I, I couldn't find the cross section of the four river where I-295 crosses it or the turnpike. But if you look at it, it's the same as the Connecticut River Valley, a much deeper valley. In some places on the four river, it, the bedrock is 160 feet deep beneath the sediments that have filled the Presumpscot River Valley and the four river valley. So there's a lots of bedrock valleys in New England that were formed when sea level was lower than it is now. <laughs> and the Hudson River Valley is the deepest. So some of the evidence of this sea level lowering was uh, deposits of shallow marine shells. This is from a quarry in uh, Cumberland in the, uh, the Maine State Museum is a, a mammoth tusk that was found in Scarborough. There's these ophiroid um, starfish was found in clay, in the presumpscot clay. A piece of tree 
that was found over uh, by uh, Barber Foods area off of St. John Street. And uh, this is a photo I took on a field trip uh, back then. So the uh, landslides that have, I'm going back, the landslides that have occurred in historical times and prehistorical times may have been responsible for changing a lot of the landscape. Some people think that a big landslide in Westbrook called the Sakarapa Slide, this would have occurred around where the uh, hardware store is on the Westbrook Bypass and diverted the Presumpscot River perhaps so that it was captured by a stream that flowed uh, northwards uh, to uh, its current area in Falmouth, Portland border and may have extended, the river may have originally extended into the Four River. That's the dashed line that I'm showing you here. And so here's the, the river again, the diversion of the river as it goes northward and out into the uh, bay and the uh, extension of the Four Rivers is, is right here, could have been uh, there. So uh, these landslides that occurred uh, along the river, this is one that occurred in 1983 along the Stroud water, exposing lots of presumpscot formation and uh, doing a little bit of havoc with some cars and house uh, on Long, off of Longfellow Street and Brackett Street in uh, Gorham near the Westbrook, Westbrook line. The big one in 18, it's actually should be 1868, it's a, a typo there, uh, occurred near just below the uh, Cumberland Mills the sappy uh, plant, um, S.D. Warren. People visited it, and this is from the Portland newspapers of 1868. And then people may remember the one of November of 2020 off of Warren Avenue, a landslide that occurred and uh, moved sediment from uh, the Les Wilson property into the uh, Presumpscot River uh, and changing the landscape there. Now, it's not the only landslide that has occurred historically. Uh, I did some work in 1985, and these are the frequency of landslides that have occurred uh, in our area over time. So what have we said? We've said that for the last 550 million years, Bedrock processes of mountain building and metamorphism <coughs> have shaped our rocks. Most of the rocks are metamorphic. Some are igneous, like the Sebago Pluton granites. Glaciers came along, eroded the landscape. Sea level was lowered. Deposition occurred in the sea in our area. And so we had clays, sands, sands and gravels shaping the landscape in some places forming deep basins or small little ponds where, la where icebergs sat. And the most recent little etching of the land were the landslides uh, that have occurred, I would say mostly because of human activity and to some degree, the activity of the river. So I wanted to thank you all for attending and Rochelle and Toby for inviting me. Uh, I'm happy to have shared all this information with you. I don't know if there's much time left for questions. I'm gonna leave that up to Toby. And if you have questions or comments, you could send me an email. And I'm told that this is all have been recorded so you could read it again and I'll send you the quiz in a week. 
Well, thank you very much, Aaron. We just have a couple quick questions that have come in um, in the last couple minutes. Um, somebody asked, is the basalt dike in the photo that you showed earlier of the same origin as the giant stairs in Harpswell? Yes. And there's a, a, there's a, a staircase also in Wyndham off of the, uh, a, a small one. They called it the Indian staircase in Wyndham. Yes. And also the one at um, Bailey Island is another one of these Triassic basaltic intrusions that when they cool, they form that blocky pattern that looks like staircases. Your, Toby, your... Uh, Sorry yeah, about your, that. Uh, next question, would the moraines from the formation of Sebago Lake contain Sebago granite? Yes, for sure. Mo the moraines will include sands, gravels, and mostly the most common fragment would be the Sebago granite. Occasionally you find something that the glaciers have transported a much greater distance from further northwest of us. Uh, but that's not as common as uh, fragments of Sebago rocks, um, uh, Sebago pluton granites. One, one last one here. My neighbor in the Gorham Village area has a lot of clay in his yard and dug it up in the section where he was trying to grow a garden. As a result, his garden did impressively better this year. Will the blue-gray clay surrounding it slide in and under his garden, presenting the same problem again? And if so, how long will it take for the clay to take over again? I don't think. I, I don't think the it problem was the garden did not do well before, while the clay was there and had not been yet dug out. So okay, so when after they it would be my question would for them would be after you scraped out the Sebago, I mean, the uh, Presumpscot formation, what was underneath? Or did they bring in soil? If they brought in soil, the, the Presumpscot would serve as a great uh, water uh, barrier so that when you watered it, the, the water would sit in your new soil and your veggies and plants should do better, I, I would think. Sounds I don't think you have to worry about slide, landslides on the margin of the garden. Good gardening tip for everybody coming into the early spring here. <laughs> That's all we have right now, and we're a couple minutes after seven, so I think we'll, we'll call that the end of the presentation, but thank you, Erwin, so much. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And the, just you. the last thing I'll say, as many of you know, we have a lot of members on the call. Membership with the Land Trust is the main support for all of our activities from conserving land to creating and managing trails to putting on events like this. So if you're not yet a member, I strongly urge you to consider joining us with a donation of any amount. And you'll hear more about that in email follow up to this. And thanks again for attending. And thank you again, Erwin. You are a fountain of knowledge. <laughs>